Indian growth story is partly predicated based on its demographics which illustrate a booming working population contributing to a rise in economic consumption and productive activity. However, there are major inherent risks which threaten to derail this possible success trajectory. According to a study by the City and Guilds Group India in 2015, a whopping 97.7% of India's working population is unskilled. While the figures quoted are alarming, the implications are supported by several other studies, including the government-funded ICRIER, which found that unlike China and its neighbours, India may not be able to climb the ladder of development simply by recruiting its many unskilled people to manufacture goods cheaply. In this episode of India Risk Report, we address the critical concern of skilling India and the future of the country's employment and what it would mean for the growth of our economy. Hello and welcome to another episode of India Risk Report. And in this episode, we are looking at the challenges that India faces with its demography and the demographic dividend if it can really be made to deliver and its impact on India's economy, India's business and India's work culture. And we have two experts with us who are going to throw more light on the subject. We have Mr. Rajiv Kapoor, who is the executive director for the group for the human resource aspect for Uno Minda. And we have with us Vishal Sharma, a former army officer, as I've just learned, who's with the National Skill Development Corporation of India and a Chief Program Officer. And we are going to today examine the various challenges that are there for India and the Indian population. Now, as I understand, as far as India is concerned, much of our demographic dividend is going to be predicated on how we can make our demography and our population deliver. Unfortunately, according to a study carried out by the City and Guilds Group of India, in 2015, a whooping 97.7% of India's working population was apparently unskilled. Now, is that a challenge or an advantage that we have in terms of being able to give them opportunities and bring down the pressure on the government? Because the government, as per another set of statistics, again, in 2015 has only been able to create 10,000 jobs on an average when a million plus jobs are required each year or maybe even more than that to just make sure that the demands of the population can be satisfied in terms of a regular sarkari job if I was to use that term. So these are some of the challenges and I'll go straight to you Vishal. It is said that Skills are absent largely from our environment in terms of the work culture. Now, one of the biggest problems in that is that when the government talks about India's demographic dividend and the fact that we can take on China as an alternate base for providing uh, manufacturing opportunities for countries to outsource their business to India in term for India to be able to export those products. We don't have the skills. Whereas China has from school onwards, the education curriculum shows that they focus on skill development. What is your biggest challenge in terms of getting skill development right? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned three or four points in your, in your discussion. You talked about uh, vocationalization, you talked about manufacturing and you talked about the challenges in skilling. See, a couple of years back uh, when, uh, when, the, uh, when the government realized that there is a big skill gap in the country, as you just said, one million workforce entering every month and that makes it 12 million in a year. And vis-a-vis -vis that, we had a skilling capacity of close to just 3.1, 3.2 million at that time. So uh, then there was a you know, National Skill Development Corporation came into existence and it you know, gathered steam and then a lot of, there is a new ministry which came up, you know, which wasn't ever there. 2014, the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship was formed. And after that, you know, if you see the capacities have, has gone up from 3.1 million to close to 8 to 10 million now. So uh, you know, there, is a, there is a very major effort which has been you know, created by this ministry to be able to bridge at least the capacity part. You know, that we are getting there towards that 12 million requirement, mm -hmm. 
we are right now at 8 to 10 million. Now we have state governments having skilling capacities, we have 21 ministries doing their skilling, skilling activities, we have CSR activities, we have World Bank which has been roped in for the next few years. So, so that is one. Second, you talked about the vocationalization. And you will be happy to know that you know now we have uh, vocationalization happening in schools as well as colleges as well as in engineering polytechnics. So what's happening earlier, uh, you know, now we have close to uh, 28 states with about 8, 8 lakhs, 8,000 8, schools doing uh, uh, vocationalization in their education programs. We also have something known as AICT. AICT has launched its uh, BVOC programs where it is you know ensuring that a person who gets into the you know he, he can get a, a diploma or a or a or a, a po postgraduate diploma after he passes out similarly there is a program uh, which is uh, which is sponsored by uh, ministry of human resource development in which they are also uh, trying to ensure that the people who can be uh, who can be given engineering skills in the off time hours of polytechnics and itis so this is being fully, fully funded by them. So a lot of activities are happening. That there is, uh, we have close to you know eight lakh uh, uh, schools which have got into this vocationalization, which was which was never there, and therefore. So I mean, just just to cut you, I mean, obviously the facts are all on your fingertips, but just to cut you short, can we safely say that Mr. Modi's government has really tackled the challenge head on, and? given a major a boost to creating skills amongst the Indian population because it was often said in passing that three-fourths of India's graduates were unemployable. Absolutely. See, if you see this 97.7% city and guilds report which you, which you actually quoted, this is for the formal workforce. So the Modi government has realized that there are a lot of people skilled. The person who is behind your camera, he's skilled, but nobody's ever given him a certificate. So what we have done now, there is a new program being launched known as Recognition of Prior Learning. So this RPL is going to recognize their learning, there would be, there would be an assessment and certification and that database will get into our database. So we will have some sort of a data to say that people are skilled. Okay, so he has made a lot of very, very important points and Rajiv, I want to take it further from the last point that Vishal made and that is, and I have always believed that you do not need to have a government job to feel comfortable that you are employed. Uh, you would rather, if you have confidence in your abilities, rather be able to step out and chart your own course. Now, I mean the greatest of innovators, the best uh, entrepreneurs, they never went through a formal employment route, but they often just took charge of the situation and delivered. Now, in the corporate sector, do you necessarily feel that when somebody walks in for a job, that you look for his CV to have all the right boxes to tick, or are you? Can you say hand on heart that you and many others like you in the business would be willing to give a guy a chance who doesn't necessarily have the certification but has the skills that Vishal brought out that can really make him deliver? When we are looking at hiring skilled people, so of course basic skills are required because the person has to deliver on the job. But the biggest thing which we look at is the ability to learn because I think uh, the ecosystem is changing rapidly and one of the major factors is the people who are already skilled may not be relevant if you look at 5 years from now, 10 years from now. So we also look at a learnability factor, uh, a person is uh, ability to learn, if that is found positive then that is the candidate for us. So we, we look at that also. Okay, great. Uh, I go back to you, Vishal. Now it says that uh, you see there is a lot of requirement for skills, but at the same time if you become too skill centric, somebody has to go out and do the legwork. And anybody who is given a skill certification would then turn around and say that this hard <coughs> labor related activity which doesn't mean just picking up stones from the roadside but actually being out in the heat and dust is not something that I want to do because I just want a comfortable chair in a comfortable office complex and to be able to sit in front of a PC and make a lot of graphs and <coughs> keep delivering on a certain level but that is not necessarily all that we need and it's a point that we had uh, discussed uh, earlier uh, that, you know, people who get regularized jobs are often not earning as much as people who are earning today 
as casual labor in some of the cities which have the capacity to pay, like Delhi, Bombay, Gurgaon, wherever else, where people are doing <coughs> multiple jobs during the day and making money, and it's not taking a chance. But you have a regularity of a job as a household help or as, uh, you know, working as, a, uh, as, as some kind of a part-timer in four or five places, and you're probably <coughs> earning more than what a skilled job will give you. So how are you attracting people to take up skills? and yeah. assuring him of a better life. You'll be surprised, I went to Bangalore in one of the training centers and they were out of a batch of 30 students, there were 29 girls. And when I asked their qualifications, they all said, all, I started with the corner from one girl and they all one by one told me and you'll be surprised, all of them were BTECs. All BTEC girls attending a short term skilling program under the Skill India program. When I was surprised, I asked them, why are you doing this course? Mm -hmm. They said, Ki, sir, this program actually is linked to employment. So we are ensuring that they get an employment there. And as Rajiv said, we are getting the input from the industry mm. as to what does the industry want. And we are accordingly tweaking our syllabus and, and, and the, the qualification packs, which are industry relevant. Mm. And we retire them after every two years because the technology changes, as he's saying. And we have kept 40 hours of soft skills, digital literacy and those things. We realize that when, a, when Mr. Raji would interview a, a candidate, he will mm. not only look at his domain skills, but he will also look at his body language and his soft skills. Right. So, all, so all that has been included and you'll be surprised to know that there are 250 different trades. So a student has a repertoire of, you know, a basket of trades to choose from. So he, he gets excited. He, there's an apparel, there's an electronics, retail, telecom. Yeah. He has whatever he, he can choose, whatever he feels like. And then you do a counseling and then you see, you see his aptitude and attitude and you tell him, please go to so-and-so center. It's a government funded program and he goes and attends it. So that's how you excite him. And then, and then, there is, and then, and then we conduct these job fairs and job mm. mailers, mm. which create a lot of buzz around jobs and a buzz around you know, the, the program. So we have uh, close to conducted around 800 such job fairs in the country. And as we speak, uh, as we speak today, uh, 7.4 lakh people have already got jobs uh, okay. through the skilling program. Okay, so, so, so obviously, Obviously, there is a lot happening and a lot happening, something which we are often not privy to because it's not being publicized. So one of the lessons that come out of our discussions right now that it needs to be given greater visibility and publicity. But quite clearly, the Indian job market remains one of the toughest to understand and to be able to crack it. How this can be done and how India can further tune its systems to cope with the challenges in the years ahead will be discussed after a break. Welcome back. We continue to have our two guests with us and we are looking at the challenges that India faces with its population, its human resources and uh, how it can actually prepare the next generation of Indians for the challenges for the Indian economy in terms of skill development, in terms of qualification, and in terms of modifying some of our curriculum to actually suit what the next generation of technologies would require. So Rajiv, you know, one of the things that I find which is, it always perplexes me, that how do you, in the human resource business, in the corporate sector, uh, how do you, differ from the government sector because in a government job if I was to apply for I would know that I need A, B, C, D, E qualifications and therefore at least I reach the selection stage where I may be rejected. But in the corporate sector it's also becoming almost a given that if you don't have a management qualification or if you don't have a few other certifications and I know the younger generation uh, goes in a tizzy trying to, you know, make their CV well-rounded so that they're suitably placed for the right job at the right time. So are there signals that you send out? Is there a standard uh, procedure or you allow them to have the basic skills and then you just go on your gut feeling to select them? Yep. So I think the last sentence which you said, we go by the CV for the entry purpose. But I think uh, after that, on-the-job training starts because every organization has a different DNA, a different culture. So we have to make sure that they, they are suited to be employed in that kind of an environment. So a lot of training is uh, done for every new entrant in the organization. Mm -hmm. And so that then starts honing that person's skills also as per the needs of the organization. Mm -hmm. So qualifications, yes, but skills are more important now. The uh, competencies, the capabilities, those are the areas we are looking at. 
So qualification is an entry level, it opens the gate for you, you enter. After that, it's the competence and the skill which you bring to the table. And just That's an add-on question, how can you motivate people to stay on after all the investment you've made in time, resources and money in enhancing their skills that they don't just sidestep to the next best opportunity? That's always a challenge. That's always a challenge and attrition uh, is playing heavily on the minds of the HR people. But of course, uh, providing different opportunities and what's the trend now is that you, you provide horizontal mm. opportunities to people and it, the trend is changing in India. Mm. In India, if you look at about 10, 20 years ago, a person who joins a function mm. retires from the same functions. Mm. But now the younger generation is willing to take challenges, they are willing to take risks. They do sidestep and take a horizontal deployment take another function. So they are multi-skilling themselves because I think that is the only way to stay relevant in the future. Okay. Okay, Vishal, here's a sort of a negative take on our educational system. Uh, we have many faults with our educational system, but I think four of them stand out. One is rigid syllabus. Second is uh, this whole obsession with having your final exam sorted out and that defines your future. The third is the failure of vocational training related uh, courses to <coughs> encourage people to take that line, though you have given a, uh, an interesting uh, example of Bangalore. And most importantly, teachers and their skill and their qualifications to really do justice uh, beyond what they've been teaching for the last 10, 15 years. Are they getting their people to look ahead? Because if you compare in China, that from compulsory schooling of after nine years, uh, half the children choose vocational training. In Germany, they have only 340 courses in, as per their classification of programs, which are required for people to proceed further. India, in contrast, has more than nearly 10,000 <coughs> standards and courses and programs. So obviously, there's a wide variety of choice, but it also leaves a lot of confusion. <coughs> in the minds of people that what skill do you bring to bear if you have B-Tech with marketing as against B-Tech with programming or something like that. So where do we really <coughs> draw the line? I mean, are you also going beyond enhancing skills of already trained people or educated people to actually enforce something on the curriculum? Yeah, so uh, no, uh, National Skill Development Corporation is executing the Skill India mission of the Prime Minister, which is for the bottom of the pyramid. So what we are doing is that, you know, we are taking, uh, we have sector skill councils which are industry bodies. To, to give you an example, the health and, uh, the beauty and wellness sector skill council is led by Vandana Lutra. The healthcare sector skill council is led by Dr. Naresh Trehan. So these are, you know, very renowned people in their respective sectors and they give us input as to what exactly the industry wants. So we are with the times. So we make our qualification packs as per the, and the qualification packs are validated by these industry captains and industries. So we are not just killing them what we feel like, we scale what the industry wants so that the employability is better. So in that sense, you know, uh, uh, we, also, uh, we also keep changing these qualification packs to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. Like after, after every two years, since the technology would change, these mm -hmm. qualification packs retire. Mm -hmm. And these 10,000 standards which you talked about are actually not courses, these are standards which, which culminate into only around 2,000 courses. So we have 2,000 courses. Still, 350 and 2,000. Yeah. But those 2,000 have f further been uh, you know, compressed into 252 courses, which are most popular in the country. So past experience of two, three years has, has told us that there are 250 odd courses which are most popular in the country. Mm. So now the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, which is the flagship scheme of the Prime Minister, mm. is executing this program only on 250 courses. Mm. So we are taking care of that. Regarding the vocationalization, a great beginning has been made, as I already talked about. Just to give you some numbers, 8,000 schools, 6 lakh students, uh, 39 NSDC partners, and uh, about 104 job roles are already undertaking, have already been launched for the schools. It's already going on. For higher education, I talked about close to 200 colleges are already doing the BVOC courses in the country. And similarly, I talked about these uh, other courses. So vocationalization has taken off in a big way. It wasn't there earlier. Now, mm -hmm. NSDC has, robed in, uh, has got roped into this. So NSDC, ASET, M MHRD, and MSD. And with the, with the schooling system of the country, we are actually giving this a big fill-up and a big push. So I think we are on the right track. And we are finding that the students are getting jobs. As, as I talked about, every day we are placing close to 1,200 students from all these training centers. We have around 8,000 centers across 684 districts mm. in the country out of 715 districts. 
So there is a penetration happened, LWE districts are getting targeted, Northeast JNK is getting targeted. We are going very scientifically. We are doing a demand-based killing, not a supply-based killing, which was happening in the first 12 times. So demand-based killing, where is an investment of more than one crore happening in a cluster? Which is that cluster famous for? Is that is there investment is happening in aerospace, then you skill in aerospace in that sector. So that the migration doesn't happen from anywhere to anywhere. Otherwise, the JAT agitation and all this, which you talked about, you know, this is happening because <coughs> there has been not, not a proper scientific way of ensuring the scaling in various pockets. So we are getting data from CMI. You know, we are also learning our ropes and lessons. So we are ensuring that the clusters and the states, so there is no skew of sectors and, and geographies. We are okay. trying to ensure that balance. Okay. Uh, uh, Rajiv, uh, you know, one issue for the corporate sector is giving regular jobs to people as against contracts to labor. The second thing is how do you have the key technologies that will enhance your growth stories? Are there are they expectations from the government to help you do that? Because at the end of the day, government and the media tends to be very happy when our overall GDP figures and projected figures and economic growth story looks better and better. But if that be the case, is the government in, be expected to deliver more in the terms of what the corporate sector's challenges are? or you are left to be on your own in the hands of the Lord Almighty till you eventually deliver results and then it's said that yes, good going. These figures we now can boast about. Okay. Uh, if I look back 10 years, uh, we were very much on our own. The industry was doing what they needed to do. Uh, the courses were not relevant. There was no support coming. Uh, if I look at the last four or five years, yes, uh, a lot of speed has been picked up. The government has uh, 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 hastened up the process. Like you said, visibility is less. But let me tell you, because I do attend uh, these meetings and I do interact with these people, I am also a member of a sector skill council, mm. which is on the automotive and autocomp sector. Mm. Uh, a lot of good work is happening. Mm. And uh, now, yes, their government has really launched some of the great initiatives, <coughs> one of them being, let's say, the NEEM scheme, which is a national employment enhancing uh, mm. mission, enhancement mission. So I think under this also, people are earning while they are learning. So and this is really supporting the industry in a, in a big way, although it's in an, it's a very nascent stage, uh, let it uh, take the test of time, I think the next two, three years. Uh, this will be a very, very good scheme if, if we are able to launch it and uh, sustain it effectively. So a huge amount of work is happening at the government level. I, I also must compliment the people who are heading the NSDC, the, the kind of professionalism they bring on. It's really, really positive. You get a very positive vibe when you now talk to NSDC people. And they are people from industries, they understand the business nuances, so they are really able to understand and help. Okay, so very important points have been brought out and very clearly it is now evident from what has been highlighted by our two experts that the government has gone into a <coughs> proactive mode. The government is doing a scientific appraisal of what really the Indian skills uh, capabilities are and where it can be enhanced and where it can be addressed more. And most importantly, uh, while jobs and their creation may take time, but at least there is a desire to enhance the benefits that would come from India's demographic dividend. And to that extent, uh, I go away from this discussion feeling uh, rather upbeat and positive that things are not as dismal as they were, which I felt they were before I started the discussion. Thank you very much for enlightening us. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye.